Hi, welcome to episode three in the Quick Strategy series. My name is Craig Lawrence. I'm a strategy advisor and strategy consultant, and I work across the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors, helping organizations develop effective strategy. Before that, I was the lead for teaching strategy and strategic leadership at the UK Government Strategy School in London. And before that, I was a general in the army. And I'm really excited that on our opening screen, you'll have seen a new little logo bottom right on the screen. And that is because at the back end of last year, we won an award for excellence in the design and delivery of our strategy masterclass. And the actual trophy is here. It looks like that. So we're really pleased with that. Anyway, today, what I'm going to do is build on episode one, which looked at what is strategy. Episode two, which looked at why strategy making is so difficult. And I'm going to introduce you in this episode to a methodology you can apply to help you develop strategy that will be effective. And then in the next episode, we'll look in a little bit more detail at some of the tools I'm going to introduce today. So I'm going to disappear top right on your screen, and then I'm going to talk you through a series of slides. And in 15, 20 minutes, we'll get back together and I'll explain where we go from here. So here I am top right on your screen. And you remember in the previous episodes, we identified that this definition by Harry Yaga was a good working definition of strategy in that strategy provides a coherent blueprint to bridge the gap between the realities of today and a desired future. You'll also remember we developed this idea of bridging further and we actually represented our strategy as a bridge where we are down bottom left. Our strategy is the bridge taking us through the strategic environment over, say, three to five years to achieve our vision or desired end state. It's built on a bedrock of values and it goes through and operates in the strategic environment. And the reference to not Denmark top right, you'll have to look at episode two to understand what that means. We identified that strategy is often difficult because we're addressing what Rittle and Weber, two professors at the University of California in 1979 termed wicked problems and what Richard Rummel terms gnarly problems and what Ronald Heifetz terms adaptive problems. And these are problems where there's not a great deal of agreement about what the problem is and there's certainly no agreement about what the solution might be and there's no certainty that when we apply our solution, it's going to achieve the desired result. We also said that strategy was difficult because it operates in an environment over which we don't have a huge amount of control. So over the three to five years that we're trying to implement our strategy, all those things around us in the strategic environment are changing. There could be conflicts, there could be technology, disruptive technologies like AI, there may be pandemics, it's very hard to understand how all of those are going to unfold. And it's very hard to determine the impact they will have on our strategy. But what is clear is that they will all throw up opportunities that we need to identify. And they will also throw up obstacles that we're going to need to overcome to achieve our desired future. What are the problems with identifying how these things are going to impact on us? is actually understanding what's happening. So if this is a, a three horizons model, it's really useful for understanding how change impacts on what's happening. So if you go onto the X axis and go to now and then go up the Y axis to the horizon one line, so the brown line, these are things that are happening now that we're aware of. They're visible, they're well understood and they're being responded to and something like climate change would fall into that category. Drop further down to the horizon two line. This is something like AI, how it's gonna develop is uncertain. Many of the key trends and drivers of change that define it are visible now, but we're not quite sure how it's gonna pan out. And certainly from a strategy perspective, we're not quite sure how it's gonna impact on our strategy, but there are opportunities there as well as obstacles. From our perspective, one of the most worrying is the Horizon 3 changes, because these are ones that are emitting only very, very weak signals. They may suddenly appear, or to us, it'll look as though they're suddenly appearing, but there are weak signals out there. And this is uh, examples of this will be the financial crisis a few years before it occurred, when some people were raising concerns about the number of subprime mortgages that were failing. It could be the pandemic a year or so before it occurred or hit this country. 
there's all sorts of weak signals, but you need to be looking for them to find them. You've also got other actors, people with their own strategies, probably trying to achieve their own end states, maybe similar to ours, and what they're trying to achieve could impact on the way our strategy unfolds and the effect that our strategy has. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty. It's unpredictable and it's competitive, the environment in which we're operating, which means that the future doesn't look like this. There isn't a single future toward which everybody is marching. There's lots of multiple futures. And which one unfolds is really hard to actually get a feel for. You could develop this further. This is a thing called a, a futures cone. It was developed from an idea called a cone of plausibility, developed by somebody called Charles Taylor, who was at the Strategic Studies Institute in the States. And he produced this cone of plausibility in 1988. This version, produced by Joseph Foros, is a development of that. And it gives you a whole range of different futures that could unfold. The ones we're going to focus on are the projected future. So if the past were to keep going forward, the future would look like the past projected through, if that makes sense. The probable future is how the future will unfold given what we know of the trends and the changes and the behaviors of actors around us. But what we're really focused on is the preferable future as it relates to our organization or our state. How do we want the future to unfold? And the trick is to identify the opportunities and the threats and the obstacles that the future creates that we can exploit and overcome to make the preferable future be the one that actually manifests. So we're trying to shape the future by identifying and exploiting these opportunities and identifying and overcoming these obstacles so that the future that unfolds from our perspective is the preferable future. And as we're identifying those opportunities and trying to exploit them to enable our organization to achieve its desired future, we might even come across what Chan Kim and Rene Mauborn call the blue ocean of a new opportunity or a new market that nobody has occupied before, nobody has even identified before. If you look at this slide, this was a snapshot in September 22 when the book on the left was being sort of final draft stage. And it shows the 10 largest companies in the world by market capitalization. And that's the total value of all their shares. And if you look at six of those in bold, all of those are founded on blue oceans of new opportunity. Amazon's really interesting because there's a great example there. There's a chap called Charlie Ward, who was an engineer in Amazon, who in the early 2000s noticed that a sector of their customer base was becoming increasingly time sensitive rather than price sensitive. And in 2005, they launched Amazon Prime, which guaranteed that you would get your product that you bought within two days. By 2021, it had over 200 million paying subscribers. So there was somebody saying, here's an opportunity. People becoming increasingly time poor. If we can deliver something that helps them with that, then maybe we can create a new market. And they were the first people to do that. Walmart now deliver a thing called Walmart Plus, which is similar. But there's a really good example of people looking to the future, looking at trends and identify the blue ocean of new opportunity. So if we go back to our definition, the desired future, that's the preferable future. And what we've got to do really to sort of formalize this is understand that highly effective strategies make the desired future more likely by exploiting the opportunities and addressing the threats and obstacles that the future creates. So the trick then is how do you identify these likely future opportunities and the threats and obstacles and then build the best possible strategy around them to achieve your vision or desired end state. And that's what we're going to look at. So effectively, what we're trying to do is on a bigger scale, play snakes and ladders. I really like this analogy. We're down at number one. We're trying to get to 100 at the top. And what we're trying to do is look to the future and identify the ladders we can use that hopefully others miss to take us toward our desired future and avoid the snakes which will take us back. And the ladders are the opportunities, the snakes are the obstacles. 
most strategy making methodologies or approaches are comprised of a number of steps. Firstly, understanding what's happening and what the desired outcome is. Start with why the famous Simon Sinek book. You really need to know why you need a strategy because it may well be you don't need a strategy at all. Develop the options to achieve the desired outcome, exploiting those most likely opportunities and addressing the most likely threats. Selecting the most suitable option, implementing the most suitable option then as the strategy and reviewing the strategy's performance and adapting it as necessary. The last stage is fundamental. About 50% of all strategies fail and they often fail because people don't monitor their strategy's performance. And the problem if you don't do that is that your strategy is built on a series of assumptions you have made about how the future will unfold and how other actors will react or act. And it's probable, very probable, that your assumptions are not right. So you really do have to adapt your strategy, constantly see whether, assess whether the assumptions that you made that your strategy is built on are actually correct or proving to be correct. You can take those bullet points and turn them into a process, turn them into a cycle. This can be done very quickly. You can go through this cycle in 30 minutes if that's all you have, or you can take more time over it. I'm gonna focus on the bit in the middle about critical thinking questions, because it's really important that you ask critical thinking questions as you go through your strategy development. And the reason for that is that many people don't. And that's another reason why many strategies fail. So critical thinking then is not about being negative. The term critical comes from the Greek word kritikos, meaning discerning. So critical thinking is a deeper kind of thinking in which we do not take things for granted, but question, analyze and evaluate what we read, hear, say or write. It's a general term used to identify essential mindsets and skills that contribute to effective decision making. Now, I think that's a really good description of what critical thinking is. And Cynthia Cordova is uh, an academic at De La Salle University in the Philippines, but I think that's a really good definition. There are lots of examples where people didn't apply the critical thinking. Now, this report was published in October 21, following an inquiry by two UK parliamentary committees into the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, primarily in England. And you can see there that they found it surprising that the fatalistic assumptions behind the initial scientific advice were not challenged until it became clear the NHS could be overwhelmed, particularly given alternate strategies were being pursued visibly and successfully in East Asian countries. And they went on to say, that pandemic planning was too narrowly and inflexibly based on a flu model, which failed to learn the lessons from SARS, MERS and Ebola. So there's a really good example of people not applying critical thinking to the assumptions underpinning the strategy that they developed to combat or to counter coronavirus. But it's not just in the public sector, it's also in the private sector. Now, the Financial Services Authority, the FSA, were the body that regulated the financial services industry from 2001 to 2013. And in December 2011, they published a report into why the Royal Bank of Scotland failed in 2008, requiring the government to inject 45 and a half billion. And one of the questions they asked themselves as they did their inquiry was why were the regulation and the FSA's supervisory approach deficient? And the answer were that the FSA's approach reflected widely held but mistaken assumptions about the stability of the financial systems. So there's two really good examples where assumptions were just accepted. Had they applied critical thinking, I hope the situation might have been very different. So we've got our five stage approach to strategy making. We're gonna apply some critical thinking questions so let's start with stage one. Well, you've got to ask why you need a strategy. Often you don't need a strategy. Sometimes you need a plan. There's not a great deal of uncertainty involved in what you're doing. So you don't need a strategy, you need a plan. And if it's just about ends, ways and means and has nothing to do with trying to shape the future or deal with the uncertainty of the future, then it's a plan, it's not a strategy. 
And when you've decided you do need a strategy, you've got to be clear what you want it to achieve. And there's a whole range of sub questions we can ask to try and help us do answer question one. Core values that should shape the strategy. You'll be familiar, many of you will be familiar with Peter Drucker's um, expression that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, it does, it, it, it really does. So we need to make sure that we get the core values that shape the strategy in place early on. And those core values should chime with those of our own organization. Otherwise it's highly likely the strategy is gonna fail. Then we get to the, to the big one, the opportunities we can exploit and the threats and obstacles we need to be overcome. We'll go into this in more detail, but very briefly, there's a number of different tools and techniques we can use to do this. We can look at the world through different lenses. So we can look at the environment in which we're operating once we know where we're trying to get to in terms of what we want our strategy to achieve. We can put our political glasses on and look at what changes, say, over the next five years are likely in this political arena. Likewise for economic, social, technological, legal and environmental. And if we focus on these and we ask ourselves, so what does that mean for our, us trying to achieve our vision, then we should be able to identify some of the opportunities that likely changes are going to create and some of the threats and obstacles that these likely changes are going to um, throw up that we're going to need to address. But we're gonna end up with loads of those. So what we need to do then is do some impact likelihood mapping and identify each of these changes, try and plot them on our little um, impact likelihood matrix here. And top right, we've got these great opportunities and big threats that are highly likely to materialize across the spectrum, the PESL spectrum. Green is an opportunity, red is a threat, yellow, we're not sure, could go either way. Our strategy must take account of the threats and opportunities identified top right, and should take account of those top left. Because if those do materialize and we've already considered them, then we're in a really good position to get competitive advantage. Go to question four, who else is interested and why? and are they opportunities or threats, we can do a similar thing. We can do some stakeholder mapping. We can plot them on power, interest matrix, power to help us achieve or stop us achieving our vision, and whether they're interested in what we're trying to achieve. And those that we've identified top right, again, red, they're likely to oppose us, green, they're likely to support us, yellow, we're not sure, could go either way. Our strategy must take account of those key players and should take account of the latents. And there's some really good examples of latent being persuaded to support a, a strategy. Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997. He'd founded the company or co-founded the company in 1976, but he'd been ousted in 1985. He was brought back to the company in 1997 because it was struggling, it was failing. And he realized that with unless his... Apple computers continued to run the um, applications developed by Microsoft, like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, then he was really going to be struggling to market his computers. So he reached out to Bill Gates personally, contacted Bill Gates and said, look, we will drop some legal suits we've got or legal cases we've got against you if you allow us to continue running your applications on our computers and we'll give you an opportunity to buy equity in Apple. Bill Gates agreed, surprised many people, made the front page of Newsweek and Time, but it was a really important example, a really interesting example of a latent stakeholder being persuaded to become firmly green and to move to the top right quadrant. So if we can do that, then we're in a really good position to understand the opportunities that are gonna come from changes in the environment and the threats, and also the opportunities and threats that other actors could pose. And then lastly, question five, what strengths do we have to exploit opportunities and overcome threats and obstacles, and what weaknesses do we need to protect? This is really important because we can bring everything together here. Highly effective strategies take an organization's strengths, use them to exploit an opportunity and to address a challenge and um, an obstacle. So it's really useful to know what our strengths are and also what our weaknesses are that we're gonna to need to protect or do something about. Moving on then to stage two, a handful of different questions here, the conditions that must exist for the vision to be realized. Here we take the vision and deconstruct it into three to five different um, strategic objectives or conditions. If we were to achieve those, then we would have achieved the vision. 
it's important to realize they're not a platform to achieving the vision. They are the vision in the sense as if we've achieved those, then the vision will have been achieved. And then how can we create these conditions? This is great fun. This is the bit I enjoy most when I'm working with organizations. It's whiteboards and post-its. And what we're trying to do is take each of those strategic objectives and identify the actions. And the actions are based on the opportunities we've identified, the actions that we need to take to achieve each of those strategic objectives. And then if you're doing it with a couple of groups, you can split the group into subgroups. Each can go off and come up with its own view. We can then compare the different courses of action that we have got using the five tests of strategy, and they are suitability, feasibility, acceptability, sustainability, and adaptability. And we can give them some sort of subjective score, but they are subjective scores. So if you took this at face value, you'd say, ah, it's course of action C. But actually it's not, because suitability, the first test, is about does it achieve the strategic objectives? So you can have a high scoring course of action, but it's unlikely to achieve the objective. So we don't, we wouldn't want to go for that. The one we'd probably go for here is course of action B, because it achieves the strategic objectives and it's adaptable. And remember that we are going to have to adapt our strategy because it was built on these assumptions about the future and they're probably going to be wrong. So in stage four, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we've got a complete strategy. Now, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a thing called the house of strategy. And this is a really good visual way of representing all the component parts of our strategy. The higher purpose could be the mission of the organization, its reason for being, or in the public sector, sometimes it's just a policy or a policy objective. The vision is what we're trying to get to, our desired future. Then under each of those uh, pillars, we've got a strategic objective and then a plan, which is all those actions we've identified that will enable us to achieve each strategic objective. So you can call them pillars, you can call them anchors, you can call them columns, you can call them priorities, you can call them whatever you will. And you see them given all sorts of different names of different strategies. But the important point is that there's a clearly articulated plan for achieving each strategic objective. If there isn't, then you have no theory of success and you have no strategy. It can't just be a general direction of travel. There have to be actions, sequenced actions, that will achieve each strategic objective, and only then will you actually have a strategy. So you need to check that you have that. Another way of visualizing it on the right is to use a campaign planning approach, a sort of a military campaign plan, not a Gantt chart, it's different to a Gantt chart, but it shows on different lines of development, different activities, the actions you're gonna to have to take to achieve each strategic objective. And it's a really good way of visualizing those actions, the sequencing, the coordination of the actions to achieve the strategic objectives, to achieve the vision. And then we've got the strategy going back to the house of strategy built on our better values. So when you're looking at, is the strategy ready for implementation? You're checking all of that. Do you have a risk register? Have you got all of those action plans nailed down to achieve your strategic objectives? The next one's also really important. Is our organization ready to implement the strategy and then support it throughout its life cycle? This is really important. If the organization isn't aligned behind the strategy, then the strategy is not going to work. There are hundreds of examples of strategies failing because they weren't aligned behind the organization. This thing here is called the McKinsey 7S framework, and it was developed by Tom Peters and Robert Waterman in the 1970s when they were consultants at McKinsey's. And what it does is it takes seven aspects of an organization and encourages you to ask a series of questions about all of them to make sure that the organization is in balance and aligned behind the strategy before it actually goes forward. I like this because at the center is shared values, which really by that they mean culture. And it goes back to that, the Peter Drucker view that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture is hugely important. And when we say culture, what we mean is the way we do things around here, which was the, the, the definition of company philosophy developed by Marvin Bauer um, nearly 50 years ago. He was an interesting character. He died in 2003 at the age of 99. Marvin Bauer was the managing director of McKinsey and Company from 1950 to 1967. So he knew a thing or two about strategy.
We then look at number 11, have we prepared the wider environment for the strategy's launch? This is really important. So as our strategy bridge starts to deploy forward and move through the environment and shape the environment and exploit opportunities, we need to make sure that that environment, to the best of our ability, has been prepared. We've got a strategic narrative. We've got messages targeting stakeholders. We're giving people a reason to care and a reason to act in support of our strategy. And the last one are the performance metrics in place. So we will know whether our strategy is working. Really important. All too often, strategies don't have metrics that will tell you whether they're failing or not. And we know there are going to be problems because we built our five-year strategy on assumptions about how the future will unfold. And the one thing we know about the future is it will not unfold as we expect it to. Um, is the strategy being implemented as intended? So we've launched our strategy and now we need to see what's happening. The first thing we have to do is to check that all those actions that we've said we're going to implement or take to achieve each of the strategic objectives are actually being taken. And then we need to look at whether they're having the desired effect because we could be implementing all the actions we've identified and we could be doing it in a really coherent and disciplined way, but actually it isn't taking us toward our preferable future. It's taking us toward a probable future or a plausible future. And that's because when we're tackling wicked problems, as most strategies do, cause and effect is really difficult, really difficult to understand. So we might think that taking all those actions is going to take us to strategic objectives, and it might well do, but it may well not enable us to achieve the desired end state. So we have to track that as well. So there's two sorts of metrics. Are we implementing the actions as we're supposed to, as we've said we will, and are they having the desired effect? And if they're not, we need to adapt the strategy. So there we go. We've got our questions, we've got our methodology, and we've got some tools. Now I've used some of these or talked about some of these very briefly in this very short presentation. But what I'm gonna do is just highlight a couple of other ones that are on this slide. And I'm gonna talk about these and others when we have the next episode, episode four. So top right, the SWOT analysis. I don't like calling it a SWOT analysis. Let's call it a SWOT matrix because we don't wanna use it to analyze stuff. We want to use it to capture the analysis we've already done. So the stage one analysis, we're gonna capture in a SWOT matrix. And we're gonna use that then as the basis for developing the different courses of action. Bottom left, that's a picture of um, somebody doing a pre-mortem. Pre-morteming is a really good idea. It was devised by Gary Klein, a professor of cognitive psychology in 2007. The assumption is that the strategy has failed. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go around the room and find out why it's failed. And this is really good because it gives people a mandate to, to try and say, well, I don't think it's gonna work because of this or that or the other. If you spin it on its head and don't do that, then it's really hard for people to challenge a strategy, particularly if the strategy is being championed by a senior colleague. It's very hard if a senior colleague is saying, this is the strategy, this is what it's going to achieve, it's gonna be successful. It's hard for somebody, particularly somebody perhaps more junior or quieter, to say, well, actually, I don't agree with that. If you flip it on its head and say, let's all assume the strategy has failed, then you're giving the quieter members of the team you're giving everybody a mandate to challenge, which is really good. And actually evidence suggests that if, you, if you're able to do this, what's called prospective hindsight, then you can improve your ability to correctly predict future outcomes by about 30%. So I really enjoy doing this, they're really successful. Bottom right, the baseball bat and the gloves, that's a war game or a decision support exercise where we actually take the strategy out and we test drive it and we have different people representing different actors, different stakeholders, and we play out the strategy and see how, what, how it would unfold. It's a really good way of identifying, oh, I didn't think of that type um, issues, opportunities, or obstacles. Anyway, we're going to look at some of these tools, techniques, and frameworks in the next episode. So there we go. Episode three, Developing an Effective Strategy, part one, overview done. Next, we'll look at part four. If you can't wait, then I strongly recommend the book, which is here, which you can get online. You can get it from Amazon, Waterstones, W. H. Smiths, wherever, because that goes into much more detail, has many more examples of what I've been talking about. If you want to do that, that's great. Otherwise, I'll see you for episode four in a week or so.
Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.